Safer Forum on Biological Physics, is that the thing? So it's a collaboration between American Physical Society, ICTP Safer, and of course the organizers is one of the lecturers here. So um, the idea is that this colloquium is for a physics audience, um, and although the people from the school are of course welcome to ask questions and everything, um, the idea is to focus more on the people who are not familiar with the subject. So it's a great pleasure to have Ralph Eichhorn here. So this is actually the third time he's been here. He started as a lecturer in one of our schools in 2014, and then 2017 you were already an organizer. Mm -hmm. yes. So we got him to, to contribute even more, and, and now he's back again as an organizer of one of the schools. So he's from Nordita, um, which is actually one of the places we have collaborations with. So if you're interested in visiting Nordita, I'm sure he'd be interested in talking to you. Absolutely. So it's a great pleasure to have Ralph Eichhorn here. He's going to speak about thermodynamics, how thermodynamics becomes stochastic. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure being here, and I enjoy my visit every time more. So, and this time I hope I will get back somehow, but let's see. Okay, as I said, the title of my talk is um, How Thermodynamics Becomes Stochastic, a short exploration of recent advances in statistical physics. And of course, such an exploration can only be subjective. So I'm going to present some recent advances um, from a, the perspective uh, I'm interested in. So it will be a selection. I cannot, of course, cover everything that happened during the last, say, 10, 20 years. Um, but I will try to give you a flavor of what I think is a very interesting development in uh, statistical physics. Uh, and for those who are participants in the school, uh, the talk is also, uh, in parts at least, a summary of my lectures, but it will go beyond my lectures too. So I would like to start with the second law of thermodynamics. This is a formulation which we most often use to write it down, that the change in entropy has to be positive um, or not negative, let's say. And this is a very important um, law, um, we know that it forbids, for instance, perpetual motion machines here. If, I mean, if you Google, you still find people who try to build these kind of machines, and there's an old picture of someone who tried. Um, then it limits the efficiency of heat engines, is probably the most important practical implication. It's related to the thermodynamic error of time, and so forth and so uh, on. So it's a very important um, law. So let's recall what this means. We have a system in equilibrium, a thermodynamic system in equilibrium, which has a certain entropy, and then we remove a constraint, something that limits the ability of the systems, and then we let relax it to a new equilibrium state, and if you compare these two states, the entropy change is not negative. Um, and a typical example of that is a gas in some kind of container where there is a wall in the very beginning. This is the constraint which limits the, uh, which constrains the gas to uh, a part of the container. Then we remove that constraint, it can expand and will have a different entropy. And the change in entropy is not negative. This is the second law. But um, if you think about it, of course, this expansion process here it's not always the same because the gas molecules, they are moving um, not in exactly the same way. So if we repeat the experiment in principle, we have to take into account that there are fluctuations in this whole process. But we also learn that these fluctuations from macroscopic systems are unmeasurably small. So in principle, we should write um, that the average entropy, averaged over many rep repetitions of this experiment, is non-negative. But for macroscopic system, it doesn't actually play a role because um, the fluctuations scale down with a script, one over square root of the number of particles involved. And this is typically 10 to 23 or something like that. But what if we look at systems which are um, made of not so many particles, of much less particles, maybe just one particle? This is what we're discussing at the school um, in part. So 
my, my favorite example here. Just one particle, this thing, suspended in an aqua solution, a colloidal particle. Just this one particle. And this, we know now, is uh, subject to thermal fluctuations. If this is of the size of a micrometer, so small systems, one particle, small systems, subject to thermal fluctuations, which actually play a dominant role in these systems. So what happens then to this uh, average entropy production? And um, even worse, if there are some driving forces which drive this system, this particle, now the particle is our system, it's in contact with the bath, it can equilibrate with the bath, but there can also be driving forces, gradients in temperature, gradients in chemical potentials, external forces, electric fields, and so on, which drive the system away from equilibrium, which um, don't allow the particle to equilibrate with the bath. What then? Can we still speak of entropy? We know entropy is an equilibrium concept, right? So can we even define changes in entropy for such a system? And this is what I would like to discuss with you during the lecture, um, that this, if you, if you do it properly, is indeed possible. Um, and as said, this particle here, by the thermal fluctuations, do, does this Brownian motion here. And just a very few words on Brownian motion. You know already it has been systematically studied by this botanist Robert Brown. And that's the reason it's named after him. And he used a microscope like that and observed for a Brownian particle something like that. So this is the wiggling motion I'm talking about. This is the effect of the thermal fluctuations. This is how a trajectory of this single colloidal particle under microscope would look like. Here, this is actually not a real observation. This is created by a simulation, but I have also uh, real measurements on that slide here. This is a real experiment. This is the colloidal particle. Um, this is in the, in the group of um, Giovanni Volpe in Gothenburg. And this is an example for the trajectory you measure over a certain time. So it indeed looks like that. And the roadmap for my talk um, is that I focus, I will des describe these things, focusing on the model class of Langevin equations, which um, are an extremely good model of this kind of systems, of this kind of motion. And then, this is very well known, the so stochastic dynamics of these particles. You learned already it has been the, the theory has been uh, initiated, the development of the theory has been initiated by Einstein's paper 1905. So it's over 100 years old. But these things, how you can do energetics with these uh, systems and even thermodynamics, this is a little bit long, younger. This is over the last 20 years. I would like to describe to you how this is done. And then I will discuss a few central results and give a sort of perspective. This is the roadmap of my talk. So let's start with the Langevin equation. Um, what we want is an equation of motion for this individual particle where we include the effects of the solution here, the aqua solution, it's, it's suspended in, in the force in the Newton equation, in, in a coarse-grained phenomenological way. And there are two effects that come from the bath. One is the friction, friction forces. That's the average effect of the bath, which is proportional to the friction coefficient of the particle gamma and the velocity, the actual momentary velocity of the particle. And then the second effect is this Brownian motion force, which is uh, a noise force which creates this wiggling motion. So it's indeed uh, modeled by a random number. and. Uh, most common model is a um, Gaussian noise. And if I say it's Gaussian, you know that I only have to specify the first two moments to fully specify the statistical properties of this object here. So the first moment is zero. There is no uh, systematic component in this noise force. And the second moment is a data correlation in time, which says that the memory in this aqua solution is extremely short. It's much shorter than anything else you're interested in. Um, so that I can say that it's actually uncorrelated for any practical purposes. 
This, that is what the delta function says here. And then we also know that this uh, noise amplitude, the strength of the noise, must somehow be related to the diffusive properties of the particles. And if you choose it like that, you recover what you know from equilibrium statistical physics when you calculate um, the distribution of the particle following from this dynamics. This is what we have seen in the lectures already. And Einstein found that this diffusion coefficient here is related to the temperature of the bath and the friction coefficient in the particle in that way. And this is called the Einstein relation. And Kb here is Boltzmann's constant. So we have these two forces which account for the effects of the bath. And then we can add other forces too, which I write here in this small f. So this is the full equation of motion now for the particle. It's called the Langevin equation. Mx double dot acceleration is equal to minus gamma x dot. This is the friction force, velocity here, plus the fluctuating force, psi of t, and other forces which are not due to the bath, like external fields and things like that. Okay, this is the equation of motion we are going to work with. And, and now uh, I also mentioned in the lecture already that actually on these scales, on micrometer scales, even in water, the motion is highly viscous. And this is very nicely described in a paper by Purcell in 1977, where he says, we know that F equals MA, but they, these objects here, he's also talking about, I think, bacteria or so, they could scarcely care less. If I have to push that animal to move uh, and suddenly I stop pushing, how far will it coast before it slows down? The answer is about 0.1 angstrom, so less than the size of an atom. And it takes about 0.6 microseconds to slow down. So these time scales and length scales are also extremely fast. So that, again, for most practical purposes, we can forget about the inertial effects in this motion. And we can go to the overdamped description. So we forget about this, set it to zero, let's say, and end up with an equation which is first order in the position of the particle. Okay? And this is called the overdamped equation. This is what we have seen in the lectures. And as uh, I said there as well, this I, what I described now is a phenomenological way to get it. But this limit here going from this description to this description is mathematically tricky because you're dealing with a singular uh, limit here, changing the order of the differential equation, and you have to deal with this weird object, with this noise term, which is, in fact, uh, nowhere differentiable, continuous but nowhere differentiable. So it's a, it's a tricky limit. If you do it carefully, you will for most cases, end up with these equations. So we are fine here. OK, that's so much about the first part, the stochastic dynamics. Yes? So this is an approximation. What, what is the approximation now? So you have, an M, you have one parameter that you've got to do for M. So yes. Parameter M is yes. small compared to the water. Yes. Right? Yes. So compared to water. Yes. Compared to the friction. You compare M to the compared to the friction you compare m to the friction so actually, we are talking about time scales in the systems. Um, and this time scale here, M divided by gamma, is a time scale. It's the relaxation time scale of the velocity degrees of freedom of the particle. I think it's confused because what you said is true for bacteria, not true for you. No, uh, no. Uh, yes. Yeah. So when yes. you put the dimensions, the proper masses, bacteria have this sort of uh, low rate of number behavior. That's a right. cell article. But you, you don't. I, I understand. I'm just asking, so what's the parameter which has to be small? So M has units and M over gamma has units. Exactly. It's a time scale. And you compare it to the time scale of, of the motion you observe, the diffusive time scale. Okay? And the, yeah? Good. And, the, and this ratio is about 10 to 6, or 10 to minus 6. Okay. Actually, this model is, it describes the system so extremely well that, that I met people who say, okay, I did this theory. Uh, and then the an experimentalist was saying, oh, I can measure that. And then the other guy said, why do you want to measure it? It's, it's, you know that it's working. <laughs> so it's, it's an extremely accurate description of, of these systems. OK, yes. So, so far about stochastic dynamics. And now I would like to describe 
how you can do stochastic energetics with these, um, with these kind of models, let's say. And I write down the Langer equation again, and now I consider the external forces coming from a potential. So this is a gradient of a potential U, which depends on X, and I also allow it to be time dependent, explicitly time dependent. And the idea here is that we are doing an experiment. Imagine a colloidal particle, for instance, or a protein, or whatever your favorite small particle is, and you, you say you use a laser, an, optic, an optical tweezers to, to trap this particle, and then you can manipulate it. You can change the laser intensity to widen the trap or increase it to narrow the trap. You can move the particle. And this is something the experimentalist does. So he does some adjustments with his equipment, and this changes the property of the system. This is like an external control parameter you have to manipulate the systems. And this is hidden in this explicit time dependence of the potential. Okay? This is what we mean here. So now I, I look at the change of the potential energy, energy for a small step the particle does during a time step dt. So it, play, it, it changes position from x of t to x of t plus dt, and then the energy changes too here to the, due to the change of position and due to maybe some external changes. And if I expand this, I get two contributions, gradient u times dx and du dt times dt. And now uh, I have to interpret these two contributions. And for the first one, we look at this equation. If I want to talk about heat, what is heat in that system? Heat is the work exchanged with the heat bath. So the forces, I the particle exchange, uh, or, or the forces that act on the particle from the bath times the displacement. This would be the energy the particle exchanges with the bath. And th since this is a heat bath, it's heat by definition. And this is what is written here. This is the two forces that come from a heat bath, right, from the solution, friction and fluctuations, times dx, times the displacement. This gives you heat. And now I use the equation of motion to replace this part here by the gradient of u. It's just the balance of forces I use here. And I end up um, minus u is minus, gradient u is minus f, so that this contribution here is actually the heat the particle exchanges with the bath. Okay? And the second contribution, this is um, a change in the energy which is um, due to external manipulations. So imagine the particle would not change its position, but the potential is changed by the experimentalist, then still it changes its energy constant. And, it, uh, and, and this is what people identify with work here. So this is the external work. And then we see that the u is equal delta q delta plus delta v, and we have a first law for this step of the motion of the particle. So this is the first law, a balance of energy uh, flows in the system. Okay? And of course, you can integrate along the whole trajectory and get the change of energy as a complete work or along the trajectory and the complete heat exchange with the heat bath. So now, this is energetics, but what about stochastic thermodynamics? What about thermodynamics? And thermodynamics, I started with a second law. What we want somehow is we want to quantify entropy. And is, is this uh, um, possible? Um, what we, the idea here is to look at the following situation. Um, not so, we are thinking not yet about entropy, but we ask the question, how irreversible is that motion? So you know these um, movies you see sometimes, the cup is falling from the table and uh, breaks, and then it's jumping back on the table. When you see it's jumping back on the table and reassembles, you know you have seen the movie running backward in time. 
okay? Because you know from experience that such a process is, has never been observed in reality. It's extremely unlikely. And here we ask the same question for the system. We look at a trajectory, this, this trajectory which has been measured in an experiment, and we ask the question, how likely is it to observe exactly the same trajectory but traced out backward, backward in time. This is what I've written here. This is the probability of the trajectory observed forward in time. So this X bar collects all the positions of the particle along a certain trajectory compared to the probability of observing the same trajectory but traced out backward in time. So we, we try to quantify how irreversible the dynamics of this particle is. And then I find, after some calculation, which involves path integrals, I don't want to go into details, that this can be written that way. So now I wrote it already very suggestively here, the delta S. And this delta S is actually this quantity where this delta Q divided by T here is given by the term we identified earlier by the heat the particle exchanges with the heat bath. And this contribution here is called the entropy production in the medium. So the, I repeat, this is the heat the particle exchanges with the bath, and this corresponds to a change of entropy in the bath, okay? And this is this quantity here. And this part here is, is a contribution of the boundary, initial and final position of the particle, which you can identify with the entropy of the system itself, so with the entropy of the particle itself. So we, we started here from a different question. We, we asked the question of irreversibility and have seen that this question is answered actually by what we naively would define as entropy from this motion of the particle, or which is actually an entropy change in the bath. The irreversibility of this motion how likely it is to, to observe forward versus backward pass is um, connected to the entropy which is like dumped into the bath, you can say. Okay, this is one of the main results of this approach. And this is the essence of stochastic thermodynamics in a way. And a better name may actually be trajectory-wise thermodynamics because you look at, at all these quantities along trajectories, so along evolution in time. The, the, norm, the term, term stochastic thermodynamics is, some, is a little bit historical. Yeah. I don't know if this is a totally rigorous, but how do you define P of X bar? Can you have no path trajectory? Yes, yes. How do you possibly do you, you, um, you can calculate this by using path integrals. So you, you're very similar to quantum mechanics. You, you write, you discretize this equation and write it and, and uh, write the probabilities for the single steps and from that you construct the probabilities for the whole trajectories. And these you can write down um, up to an unknown prefactor, but it cancels out uh, unknown prefactor which is independent of the trajectories, but this cancels out if you take the ratio. Yes. How do you compute the delta S system? Do you have an expression for it? Yeah, it's the uh, ln P of X minus ln uh, P of X T, basically. So it's um, um, the ratio of the logarithms of the probability. What's, what's P of X zero and P of X T? The probability of the system uh, coordinate uh, at the beginning and the end of the process. No, it's, so P of X0, if you like, uh, uh, can be specified by the experimentalist. You can start your experiment in, you prepare your experiment in a certain way, and this gives you how likely it is to find this particle you're manipulating at a certain position. And the P at the end of the process is that which comes out um, as the probability um, when the particle evolves with the Lorentzian equation. Or for the probability densities, it's the Fokker-Planck equation, which is water test integral for that term, or, uh, or uh, no, it's it's a usual time evolution. You don't have a path integral for that. Oh, you, uh, you can get it from a path integral if you like. But yeah. you have to compensate it from the best, right? So it's not like your x of t depends on the best also, right? 
no. So if you put V of x0, let's assume you have an experimentalist, you have uh, mm -hmm. optical tweezer. So I put V of x0 equals 1. Right? And that's or delta, I yeah. A delta function yeah. there. Now I can evolve on many different things, and that may depend on the best. My yeah, that's what I say. The, this P of xt, which enters here, is the one you get from the evolution of the system. And this but is. There some on the system, yes, right? yes, so sure, sure. Yeah, it's a distribution. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's 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 a boundary term. So often um, these things are written down without the boundary term because for large times they don't play a role anyway. Okay, uh, yeah, so, it's the time, good. Um, we are already here. This is what I want to tell you about the stochastic thermodynamics. So how, how thermodynamics becomes stochastic in these systems. And now I would like to list a few central results which have been derived uh, with these kind of approaches and which I think are very interesting. And, and the first one, uh, is these fluctuation theorems. So we start with that, we get this here, and from this um, probability of the path, we can actually calculate the probability of observing specific entropy changes. And um, the probability of observing a, a sort of um, a negative entropy change compared to the positive one is given by this equation here. This is called uh, a detailed fluctuation theorem for the entropy production along a certain trajectory. And then you can obviously average this here by bringing this on over the other side and average over all the process. And then you will get this expression. And by the properties of the exponential, you can directly derive this result from this here. So this is very often called a refinement of the second law. And it tells you that the entropy production along certain processes um, has a distribution, of course, because of the stochasticity. And sometimes this entropy production can even be negative. So people also call that sometimes transient violations of the second law or things like that. But it's not really a violation of the second law because this the second law does not apply to these kind of systems. These are driven systems, so they are out of equilibrium. The system does not equilibrate with the heat bath in these processes. Um, so with certain probabilities, you observe a negative entropy production. But the average here is always non-negative. This is the result which you also get directly from that. Okay, this is one of the results. And the second one, maybe the most famous one, is the so-called Chorzynski relation, where um, you use these results, the first law, now I write it as changes in energy and work and heat along the complete trajectory. And here's the entropy. And now I define a free energy, which is given by the standard expression. And then from the fluctuation theorem I got here, I get this result here, that E to minus delta V, the work, averaged over many realizations, is the same as E to minus delta F divided by KBT. So what does this tell us, this relation? It says, um, we do an experiment. We prepare our system. We do an experiment, uh, manipulate it in some way, measure the work we have to perform on the system to get this manipulation or which we get back from the system maybe. It's a distribution of work. And then we average this exponential and we get a relation to the difference between the free energies of the system at the beginning and the end of this process, which is an equilibrium um, concept. So the system, when equilibrated with a heat bath, has a certain free energy at the beginning and at the end. But in the middle, between these beginning and end um, states, which are equilibrium states, the system can be far away from equilibrium. So this work I measure here is a quantity which is a non-equilibrium quantity. 
Uh, and, and the non-equilibrium measurements here are related to equilibrium properties of the system. And this is, this is a very famous result in that field and has been also tested experimentally. Uh, and it's very famous by now. Um, and I, would not, I, would not, uh, I will not present experiment tests of these relation, but another one, which is very closely related, which is um, about the distribution of the work itself. It's called the Crookes relation or Crookes fluctuation theorem. And it says that the probability of observing a certain work which you, which, the system perf which you perform on the system or which you get out of the system compared to minus the work when you perform the same experiment but with a backward protocol. Then it is given by E to W minus delta F divided by KBT. Um, so here's an example. You have an RNA hairpin which is folded. This is this thing here. You connect it to a colloidal bead which is trapped by an optical tweezers and then you can pull this hairpin until it unfolds. These are these curves. The orange one are the unfolding experiments. Right? So it's this extension versus force. You know, and you see the fluctuations, which are due to the thermal fluctuations. It's moving you here, unfolded, and then you perform the same protocol backwards. So you move your optical tweezers backward. And then at some point, the hairpin refolds and gets back to its original state. And this experiment you repeat many, many times. You get a distribution of the work in both directions. So here in this blue area, for instance, is the work which the system gives back to your machinery uh, uh, during one of the refolding processes. Okay? So you do this measurement. You measure the distribution of work, uh, forward process and backward process, and compare uh, the distributions for various um, extension rates here, for various protocols. It's the different colors. And you find these curves. The dashed ones are the refolding experiments where they plotted minus the work um, to get positive numbers. And the uh, solid lines are the unfolding experiments. And this relation tells you that when these two probabilities are the same, the forward and the backward, then the work um, you performed on the system equals the difference in free energies between the folded and the unfolded state. Okay, and you see here, this is the line. So this is the line where all these curves within the experimental um, fluctu uh, within the experimental uncertainties, where all these lines cross. You see, the blue dashed line crosses with the blue solid line. So this is the point here where the um, refolding distribution equals the unfolding distribution. And the same for the green curve, where you pull with a different rate, and the red curve. Here is the crossing line. You see that this point here is independent of the protocol, which is a prediction of this fluctuation theorem, because um, it says no matter what the protocol is, you can do what you like, you will always find this relation. And from that, they got what the free energy difference of the um, unfolded versus refolded state is. And it fit very well to um, independent measurements from the other methods. This is just one example. It's one of the very earliest examples. Uh, I think you can see 2005, maybe, or something like that. But there have been many more measurements by now. Yes? Just a short question. Is it the probability to go from one position, one path, and the other path? They are not the same. These differences go to the of somehow. Sorry? Is the probability they are not the same? If you are losing some, some if you have different probabilities of this path, and the, the difference in the free energies go to the advanced changes in the dispersed part, they should not be the same. No, you have to make sure that uh, that your initial and the final states are always the same. You are not the path. Yes. So you, you, the path in between will be different. It, it unfolds uh, at different extensions, but the end 
um, state has to be always the same, the same unfolded uh, equilibrium state. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Um, and then there are also applications of these concepts to stochastic heat engines. So this is also something like in your cell, there's energy conversion going on all the time. And, and there's thermal fluctuations. So these can be interpreted as being a stochastic heat engines. And people also build um, artificial ones, like this example here, um, where you have a colloidal particle, a Brownian particle, as the working medium for your heat engine. So you manipulate uh, a Brownian particle, which is trapped by an optical tweezers, and then the expansion corresponds to uh, widen the optical tweezer, and the co uh, compression corresponds to um, increasing laser intensity and narrowing the optical tweezer, the, the potential here, and then you can heat and cool, so you get, you get a, a cycle, right? And you can, again, you can measure heat and work, heat exchange with a hot bath or with a, hot, uh, with a cold bath, you can measure the work and so on. And you can define an, an efficiency here. And the efficiency is defined as usual, it's the work you get out of this process divided by the heat uh, from the hot bath which the particle takes up. But now, again, it's a, it's a stochastic quantity because these things here are stochastic quantities. They are subject to thermal fluctuations. So you don't get just one efficiency. If you repeat this experiment many, many times, you will get different efficiencies. You will get a distribution of efficiencies. And now there's a very interesting result about the large time um, distribution of these efficiencies if you... Um, like in, in a large deviation sense, if you do this experiment for a long time, so you run this machine for a long time, and then you repeat this machine uh, cycling here for, uh, for another long time, and you look at the large deviations of the uh, distribution, efficiency distribution, you will find a curve like this. Um, universally. It doesn't matter what the details are. The properties of these curves that has been shown um, in, a, in a paper, oh, I forgot to put the reference, unfortunately, um, are, are universal and are a consequence directly of the fluctuation theorem. What, what does this curve tell you? The most important features are the following. This here is a minimum. That means, because of the minus here, uh, the probability of observing this uh, efficiency is maximal, and this is the maximal. Uh, this is the macroscopic efficiency. This eta bar is the efficiency if you average delta W and delta Q. This is the efficiency that a macroscopic machine of this type would have, or the machine for t going to infinity. And then the other thing is that this j here, this large deviation function, has a maximum at eta c, and uh, this is the Carnot efficiency you would get for this machine. So one minus the ratio of these temperatures. And that this j is a maximum here tells you that the Carnot efficiency is the least likely one in this process. Okay, and this is a direct consequence of the fluctuation theorem. You don't need anything else, almost. There, there are some technical details, but basically the fluctuation theorem tells you that the Carnot efficiency is the least likely efficiency in such a process. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, not an easy thing to do. So uh, I don't know the experimental details, but they have some heating device and they make sure that, that um, um, the time scales fit. So you have to make sure that, that the, heat, the heating and cooling goes sufficiently fast so that you don't have any gradients which are interfering with your, with your measurements. Yes? Problem of the Maxwell demon yes, and yes. where the information loss exactly. goes. And yeah. again, there are experiments when you do that and produce experimentally. Good. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, it's related to the Maxwell demon. So that's, that's one of my comments, one of my perspective comments in the end, that you can actually 
in this framework include the role of information relatively easily. Um, and information is what the Maxwell demon has to do its job. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. And then there's something that, that I qu find quite um, interesting. I, I, yeah, I gave you a framework based on the Langevin equation. So to do these things, I, I had to um, take a specific model or a model class. That's different from, from equilibrium statistical physics, where in principle we calculate partition function and then we know everything. Um, here we have to use a model and we have to use, we have to define entropy production and work and so on, quite model specific to get these things. But still, what I've shown to you has been done for quite different models, model classes, like Langevin equation, reaction networks, master equations, many different. And always you get these kind of results. You get the fluctuation theorem, you get the Zhezhinsky relation, you get efficiency fluctuations, other, other, thing, other results I did not explain in detail, which is now called thermodynamic uncertainty relation, which gives uh, um, a bound for the variations of any currents through the system. J here is, is a current uh, compared to its average, um, which is given by the entropy production in the system. Um, so this is also quite universal. And then you also get generic properties on the statistics of entropy production. Yeah. These uh, relationships that you're showing, they are even stronger than your presentation because even if I have memory on my desk, it's satisfied, right? You present on a memory free desk. Uh, it's just a larger one equation. So, Jarzinski equation, if you talk to, to Chris, he's going to tell you this is going to be better no matter what. You don't have to have a, for both the real system, you don't have an absolute Langevin. So, what's your. No, you don't have to have Langevin. That's right. right. So you have memory yeah. Uh, right, you can have a memory kernel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. As I said, it's 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 valid more more generally than I present here. That's completely right. That's what I what I say say here. There are other model classes where you still find the same relations. Okay, I'm actually coming back. No, maybe not. Let's see. <laughs> and and yeah, what I want to say here also the generic properties of entropy production. If you look at the statistics, you find generic properties here. It's just an example of what what people derived that the global lowest value of entropy production, the minimum or infimum you get, it's also following a universal distribution which is given by that. So the S here is, or minus S, because it's, the, the, it's, it's, it's a negative value, the global minimum. Uh, the statistics of that follows also universal law. So there, there are these things which pop up every time you, you um, you understand how you have to um, do thermodynamics with models which are in principle describing dynamics of um, um, systems, small systems where fluctuations play a dominant role. And that the question is then, are there universal laws um, even in non-equilibrium? Is there, I mean, this is the dream almost from the very beginning of, of, of the development of statistical physics that you can um, find universal laws also in non-equilibrium situations, not only all, so, um, not all, uh, only equilibrium. And um, people are often saying these laws are valid far, far from equilibrium, okay? Which is re related to the fact that you can do um, whatever you like with this protocol. You can drive the system very fast. But I would like to add there is one um, restriction. And here is one basic assumption always, namely that the bath your, your system is connected to, the bath which, which it can exchange heat, is in equilibrium. So no matter what you do, the bath is always in equilibrium system. And this, of course, also limits somehow the time scale. If you're driving your system so fast that you're reaching the characteristic time scale of your bath, then these things, I would say, break down. Okay, um, here is a subjective selection of references, a few reviews, and 
here are a few key results. Um, some of them I have presented here, some not. I will show this slide again, so you don't need to take photos or copy. Um, I would like to go to the uh, perspective part a little bit in the last like, 10 minutes. So there is more. So I presented for Langevin equations, but more generally you can apply these concepts or develop these concepts, I should say, for biological systems. There are attempts in evolution, adaption, um, self-replication, reaction networks, a little bit related also to what Marco presented this morning. And then uh, there are attempts now to develop these kind of um, tools for active matter. And this is also something I'm personally interested in, so I can say a little bit more after that slide. Then, of course, quantum mechanics. I also only presented classical model. Same ideas. What can you do with quantum me mechanical systems? And then the role of information. You can quite easily incorporate it here. And there's another example for a, for a very interesting um, experiment. People did again with colloidal particles and optical tweezers. This here is representing two optical tweezers. In, so this creates a double well potential for a colloidal particle. And, and this is like a bit of information left hand is one, right hand is zero maybe, and then you can, you can measure the, the uh, entropy it costs to erase a bit of information or store a bit of information, and you find that uh, you find Landauer's principle where the upper limit is Kb ln 2. So you can do these things, and then you can also develop a theory in uh, information in, in that framework. So a few brief, uh, short words about active matter systems, also because they are part of our school. Um, Julia is going to talk about active matter systems. Um, and, uh, and these systems are a collection of motile micro, macro or microorganisms. So like human crowd, herds of land animals, flocks of birds, schools of fish, ant colonies, bacteria, and so on. And, and when I talk about active matter systems coming from this colloidal particle perspective, I always have in mind a self-propelled Brownian particle. So basically a Brownian particle which can move on its own. You can say a bacteria is a Brownian particle which can move on its own. So systems like that I have in mind. There are still thermal fluctuations which play a dominant role, but the thing can uh, self-propel, move on its own. Or it can even be a passive Brownian particle, a passive tracer, which is suspended in a bath of bacteria. So it's, this tracer particle is then not only pushed around by the water molecules, but it's also pushed around by the bacteria, moving actively through the solution. And here it's taken from a from review. Um, these are, this is a plot plotting these kind of uh, self-propelled Brownian particles um, up to yeah, a millimeter in size. Uh, speed versus size. So just just to see, there are there are uh, biological and artificial swimmers here listed. So uh, people do um, a lot of experiments with these things right now. And um, if you look for a more uh, detailed definition of active matter. I found this one in another review. Active matter are driven systems in which unlimited energy is supplied directly, isotopically, and independently at the level of the individual constituents, the active particles, which, in dissipating it, generally achieve some kind, achieve some kind of systematic movement. So you're not, in this, in this description, you're not concerned about uh, where does this uh, energy supply come from. They just have it, they convert it, and they move. And this makes these systems generic out-of-equilibrium systems, which are different from the out-of-equilibrium systems I described before. Because the passive particle, if you want to drive it out of equilibrium, you apply a force. Here, these, these objects move on themselves, so you don't even, even need to apply a force. This is a comparison here, the table. The classical condensed or passive soft matter particles, they, if you want to drive them, they're external forces or fields. And here the driving is force-free. They move on their own, if you like. 
And the direction of motion is usually um, connected to the orientation of the particle, so it moves over time, diffusively very often. Here, it's given by the direction of the external fields. Energy input, as stated in the definition, is homogeneously at particle scale. So there, you feed in energy into, into the system on very small scales, and this gives rise to some new unexpected effects. And here, the energy is supplied at the boundaries, if you like. And then non-equilibrium, breaking of detailed balance. Here, this happens for individual components, and here you have to apply an external driving to do it. So there are quite some difference, but still, if you observe these systems, um, very often they, they look like, like what we are used to from, from statistical physics. They, they uh, have very similar properties, and, and the best description of this I've seen so far is from Andrea Cavagna from Rome, um, and he, he wrote, I think it was an abstract of, of his talk um, in, at some meeting where I was. Um, so the collective behavior in biological systems is a complex topic, to say the least. It runs widely across scales, microorganisms, or herds of animals, in both space and time, involving taxonomically vastly different organisms, from bacteria and cell clusters to insect swarms and up to vertebrate groups. It entails concepts as diverse as coordination, emergence, interaction, information, cooperation, decision-making, and synchronization. Amid this jumble, however, we cannot help noting many similarities between collective behavior in biological systems and collective behavior in statistical physics. Even though none of these organisms remotely looks like an icing spin, such similarities, though somewhat qualitative, are startling and regard mostly the emergence of global dynamical patterns qualitatively different from individual behavior and the development of system-level order from local interactions. This sounds very familiar, right? It is therefore tempting to describe collective behavior in biology within the conceptual framework of statistical physics in the hope to extend to this new fascinating field at least part of the great predictive power of theoretical physics. So this is actually the whole idea behind active matter. And other people say the grand aim of the active matter paradigm is to bring living systems into the inclusive ambit of condensed metaphysics, to understand the dynamics of active particles in real life environment, and here to discover the emergent statistical and thermodynamic laws governing matter made of, made of intrinsically driven particles. And this is the part where I'm interested in a little bit, and I try to approach this from a stochastic thermodynamics perspective. And just very briefly, um, so these are these systems, either bacteria that move in solution, active particles themselves, or a passive Brownian particle pushed around by bacteria. And we tried to develop um, a similar approach as for stochastic thermodynamics, asking about the irreversibility, comparing probabilities for observing certain trajectories, forward in time and backward in time. Because this question, as we learned from the passive case, is connected to uh, the entropy production. So to the question, what is entropy in such system? This is much less clear for active particles because um, it's an out of equilibrium system per se. And there is actually quite some confusion. There are, may, there are at least a handful of different suggestions of how to define entropy production for these kind of systems. What we found with our approach for um, a Brownian particle with self-propulsion is that you get um, a fluctuation relation which very much looks like the one I've shown you before, where the, here is the entropy production of uh, the entropy production in the bath, which is connected to a certain trajectory. But then there you have another contribution, um, which is related to um, the correlations that this trajectory has, um, let's say the trajectory of the passive Brownian particle here, the correlations it has with the movement of the bacteria, which are out of equilibrium, so that you cannot define, you cannot define an entropy for the bacteria bath. It's a concept that doesn't make sense. So this contribution here from the bacteria is. Uh, can be described that what we found by the 
um, by the correlations, which are here written in form of a information theoretic concept, which is called the mutual information. Okay, I don't want to say more. This is just what we found that you can uh, derive fluctuation theorems, but we get a different contribution. So you can also see, coming back to the role of information, if you want to interpret it in a different way, you could say that these things um, provide a reservoir of information, okay, which contributes to, to this fluctuation theory. Okay, and another thing that very recently popped up, I must admit I didn't read this paper yet, but I wanted to show you because I found it recently, and because also at the school we have a lecture actually on neural networks and, and machine learning, that people start to apply machine learning techniques to these kind of systems, and this is uh, Chris Shoshinsky again, the, the guy from the Shoshinsky relation. Um, and what they did, they, um, they tried to estimate the error of time or determine the error of time by, by exactly what I described before, by letting a machine learn to the distinguish between movies played forward and backward in time. So you present microscopic trajectories, forward in time and backward in time, let, let the neural network learn and let it predict the error of time. Okay, this thermodynamic error of time connected with that. And what they found is that it seems to work very well. And more interestingly, I think that they say the performance of our algorithm matches fundamental bounds predicted by non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, okay? Examination of the algorithm's decision-making process reveals that it discovers the underlying thermodynamic mechanism and the relevant physical observables. This, I think, is quite interesting. As I said, I cannot say more about this paper because I haven't studied it myself in detail. But you have the, uh, you can, uh, this is from archive, so you can Google the title, you will get it, and you can, can read it yourself. And with these remarks and perspectives, I'm at the end of my talk, and here is again the list of um, the reviews. Uh, I recommend to read if you are interested in that topic in more detail, and uh, the list of papers with some key results. Of course, it's a subjective selection, and by no means, um, ex uh, it, it by no means covers all the contributions that have been made to the field. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a very nice lecture. I think what's interesting, this is all very controversial. Yeah. I love Chris for a long time, so does you, but it's an it's a interesting question. But the question I really like in the end, when you're talking about active materials, and you're in this model where pretty much you have like a, a brownian particle plus sort of a kicking motor that can kick any time yeah. in any direction. Uh, we like to use the word smart matter, where you yeah. have an active matter driven by information. Mm -hmm. Have you? Do you want to comment a little bit more about that? It's a word we have been using in the past. That based what you think biological matter would make an interface to that. Based how you put information driving active matter. Information driving active. Based that's what happens in biology, right? Because motors are kicking, but somehow you have a signal for them from a chemical network uh -huh. that pushes a mechanical mean, system. Chem chemotaxis and things like that. Exactly. For example, yeah. Yeah. or any process like epithelial mesochemical transfer, any process in biology, I, you're giving information yeah. to active matter to behave. Yes, I, I don't know these work so well, but I know that there are uh, quite a number of uh, papers um, which um, include exactly this information aspect into the whole framework, and then what you find with these inequalities that you get bounds on uh, how much information you need to perform in a certain way so you can, you, you, or, or to, to, uh, um, to adapt and things like that. So this framework provides, instead, of, uh, I mean, the second law is a bound, right, for the entropy production. And in these cases, you get bounds for adaptivity or for performance or speed versus uh, adaption and things right, like that. Right, and get very interesting all the time scales, right? You just told about the Jarzinski inequality. So it's always true, but if you push your system too fast, then you're going to need like a, very large number of trajectories on that average to have any chance of getting a result, right? So in a sense, it's sort of a, 
No, That's is... why the Bustamante experiment that you present is far from being a total agreement uh, among people who have letters and letters. Uh, uh, so in a sense, the question of time scale, you raised the question just about the bath, that if you go so fast that the bath, you, the bath cannot uh, follow, yeah. follow it. Mm becomes a problem, but even there... But for an aqueous solution, this time scale is, I think, 10 to minus 13 seconds or something like that. So it would be difficult to do an experiment on that time scale. I understand. <laughs> no, no, but if you, if you use a Jarzinka equation, for example, people that do simulation, they do a simulation very fast, and they try to compare it with experiments on a much longer time scale, right? That's what Klaus Schulte used to do that a long time. Lots of people used to do that. Then you, you may notice that you may need a very large number of, of trajectories to no, actually... I, I think this problem is more related to the fact that in this average, the tails have quite a exactly. large contribution. And, and, and to get the tails, you need a lot of... Right, and the faster you go, the more you become tail dependent. Yeah. If, you go to, if you went infinitely slow, you didn't need the tail, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah, okay. But I think it was very nice. In that nice. sense, we agree, yeah. So can you give an explanation of exactly how does these features biolo in biology works, for example, in self-reproduction? How can the Langevin equation model this phenomenon? No, it's not, it's not using the uh, Langevin equation. In that case, people use more like these net reaction networks and, and then master equations. And then um, you can also for this class of models, I have not presented them at all, you can also write down entropy production and, and heat and so on and so forth. And, and, and develop a similar formalism, okay? And then you get similar results and can derive these bounds. Uh, so it's not that in the Langevin equation you can code that the, the biological system self-reproducts itself in, no. in some kind of... No, no, the, uh, usually, no, you don't, you don't use the Langevin equation in, for these kind of questions. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think another smaller scale example is our motor proteins, because they are driven by Brownian motion. Right. And another system which uh, would be very interesting is to study uh, the, uh, well, what you would call embryology, how from uh, an initial uh, oocyte the whole organism develops, because a beautiful experiment showing Following this, it is a completely self-organizing system. Mm -hmm. You have a huge number of cells, and then they build up the organism spontaneously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are also attempts uh, within this framework to um, to quantify the costs of self-organization, the thermodynamic costs of self-organization, and relate this to energy flows and so on, and, and give bounds and, and what what is the dissipation and so on. Yeah, that's, that's also possible within that framework. And the heat mass that drives everything, of course, is the sun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have a question. So it seems to me that um, it's important to have like, the overdump limit to write the stochastic thermodynamics, right? No, no, it's not. It's just, for me, a simplification to explain. You can do the same thing in uh, uh, having the inertia term there as well then you simply have the um, kinetic energy as another contribution. I get the second of the derivative in time is yes, another contribution. Yes, it, it will, will, uh, this will be a contribution one half m v squared, the kinetic energy. And this will contribute to the, to the energy balance. And then you can write it, you can do exactly the same thing. So just another question. So in condensate matter, usually you have like other parameter which depends in time and also in a position. So can you write all these things that is stochastic thermodynamics for this uh, other parameter? And then other parameter usually is some, some, some effective parameter which describes somehow, for instance, the phase of a, of a macroscopic system, right? So I don't know what, what the correspondence yeah. here would be. No, just asking if you, in principle, it's possible to write a Langevin equation for some other parameter, right? If yeah, yeah, you can do that, I guess. Uh, 
uh, this uh, probability uh, distribution came from experimental results, or I can I don't get it where this distribution came from. Which distribution do you mean? Uh, for example, uh, probability uh, to came and to back uh, for uh -huh. this. Okay, how can I find this distribution? Do you mean, for instance, these distributions here? Yes. Yeah, these are from experiments. Um, if you do the experiment with this on a hairpin, um, you start in a folded configuration, and one of the ends is somehow connected to a colloidal bead, which you trap with a tweezer, so you can pull. You can apply a force at this end, say, and then at some point the whole thing unfolds. And since you can monitor the extension and the force you're applying, you can uh, get the work which you perform on the system during the experiment. So for one of these curves, you get a value for the work. Then you let it refold. You get a value for the work in the reverse process. And then you repeat this experiment many times and collect all the work values. And from that, you get a distribution. OK? This is in the experiment here. The distribution I wrote down, uh, let's say, wait, here, for instance, these distributions, you can calculate analytically um, for the Langevin equation model. I didn't show you expressions, but you can do the calculation. And then once you have a certain uh, trajectory, then you ca can, in principle, you can plug it in, and you get a probability for observing this trajectory in principle. Okay. Uh, when you use um, this parameter, noise Gaussian, no, noise Gaussian, yes. I don't remember. Uh, the parameter is, um, uh, why can I say the first moment is equal to zero? I don't got it. Because the, the Gaussian noise models the uh, fluctuating effects of the thermal bars, so the pushing around. And if the first moment of this noise were not equal to zero, but had a finite value, then that would mean that the thermal fluctuations would push the particle in a specific direction. So it would move in a direction uh, just from the fluctuations, in a certain direction. And this is not what you observe. The particle is not moving on average. Okay, So the first moment has to be zero. And how can I find this parameter uh, statistically? How, where, come from? Um, here's an example for the experiment. Um, it's exactly like the Action Lab guy in principle, right? It's, it's, you, you see these things under microscope. And then you take a movie of these trajectories. And, and from that, you get. Um, as data from the experiment, you get the position of the particle here in two dimensions, x and y, as a function of t. So you get all the trajectories. And from that, you can construct any uh, distribution you like. Hello. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, just a, a comment about uh, uh, self-replication. There's a, a paper from Jeremy England. Mm. The name is Statistical Physics of Self-Replication. And they use the Crookes relation to, to compute entro entropy of uh, division and stuff. So it uh, probably a very good paper to read if you want to know about it. It's controversial, mm. this paper, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's controversial. Didn't know that, but good good to know. <laughs> this it's, it's anyway worth reading, I would say. Yeah. 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 So, Richard, since I had a relation to what. Why is it less than or equal? Why is it not equal from that? Why can't you find that it's less than equal? Why is that? Yeah, why does it's, it's a good question. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, this is, this is because of uh, the properties of the exponential. So this is Jensen's inequality here. So this is a convex or concave function, so I don't remember which one always. So if you average this, then the average of the exponential is, uh, is bounded by, by the other side. So it's, it's called Jensen's inequality. There should be some cake and coffee upstairs for people that want.